not. I was going to. I'm well. I was going to try and catch you and tell you on the afternoon at, at the beautiful St. Uh -huh. It is this Tuesday. <laughs> I looked it up and, and found out, but then you were busy with family, and I didn't uh, okay. you know, to get a chance to okay. catch you. But yeah. So glad you made it back safe. Thank you. Glad you did too. Yeah. Yeah. Rounder yeah. also said you know that Thunder's been the best record in the National League and didn't make them so good. But I know, is that yeah. is that's really so yeah. sad. Yeah. 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 In our house we were, um, we all agreed that So I think I explained your opinion correctly about next week on the cameras and stuff like that. What are the clubs though? From last week. Sorry, are you in the middle of something? No, I know. Um, Jim has a cousin who has this very faint attitude. Yeah, I think that he's mean. And I thought as well. And I think that he has a lot of graphics on the left screen and was concerned. He said, my condolences for the Cardinals. I said, but the Cardinals are going to be super screen. That's what I told him. I said, the people online in real time. Well, if they're connected to the YouTube. Listen to the connection. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, and that's what I said. It was the YouTube is different. You have these different cameras. I mean, you know what? There's some really hot teams. Well, that I told them to have early. You guys can talk. And how is your family talk? early, and you can arrange the camera right. in a way that you want to get the best. Oh, that was, yeah, that's good. Because I probably haven't seen you. Uh, yeah. I did have a list of PDFs. Yeah, did, uh, did you see it? Amanda, I did not know. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's fine. They're reading. That's fine. Can we get some more coming up? Oh, no. No, it was very good. Yeah, uh, very good this summer. Yeah, it was at the all well, time. See it for it. See it for it. Oh, well, we tried. Rachel's boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. 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 The one challenge was that he was hoping to Can you stand in front of the podium and I'll just... Oh, Rachel's ideal would be... Um, I can see more of the... Okay. I can read the text. Sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. 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 I figured we could fill out this line. Musical chairs. I know you have to get up. I don't know if I can get up. I think you've maybe faced people in the room. Yeah. 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 Are we ready? Well, good evening and welcome to um, week two of our quest series for this fall. Um, we're really thankful to, um, we have a, a number of presenters. Tonight is the second night of uh, Professor Jen Frim presenting. And then um, we have Pastor Mark Dresser here who will um, be presenting. He's here in the audience tonight and he's um, picking up cues of where to stand and how to smile <laughs> and how much uh, voice he needs to project and all those things. So he's ready for next week. 
Um, but we're glad for you being here. We're glad for all the people who are joining us out at Webland. Um, it's a privilege for us to be able to offer the Quest course. And to, um, tonight, I think, uh, in some ways, our um, Lutheran understanding of church and ministry is a unique part that we, it doesn't often come up in regular routine conversation unless there's something really controversial. Um, you may have heard that the, the Lutheran Church in Australia um, just last week, um, in, after an attempt to um, move forward with women's ordination, it failed to meet the two-thirds majority. Uh, but that's an area where church and ministry is a, is a prevalent thing. What we're talking about um, in this Fall Quest series is not as controversial, but it's also very important as we think about um, the, the offices of ministry or the way that um, the ministry of the church extends beyond just the pastoral role. I'm reading through the um, Confessing the Gospel, Systematic Theology, and it makes a, a very strong point. In, I mean, it happened to be in the section about ministry right now. Um, I'm reading through five, six pages a day to try and get through the whole thing. It's 1,200 pages, or over 1,200 pages, so I'm trying to get through the whole thing in a year. And, um, but it's talking about um, how really the ministry of the church is broader than um, what we sometimes tend to think of in our, in our somewhat um, parochial organizational structure in the church. But we're really glad for the, the ministry that... Um, is being offered and presented and discussed by each of our presenters, including Professor Jen Krim. Um, I don't know where you're coming from. You guys, I know where you're coming from, but I don't know where everyone is in Webland, but I, I like um, Dr. Vern Ruffloff's comment that um, he's a little confused by winter coming before fall. And uh, <laughs> here in Edmonton, we had um, uh, um, significant snowfall as a Thanksgiving <laughs> present yesterday. And it's caused some traffic delays and other things, but um, we're not necessarily ready and eager for uh, for winter to be here. But we're glad for the warmth of this room and the warmth of the love of Christ in our hearts. Um, just one more thing before I begin with a word of prayer. Um, tomorrow morning early, um, Professor Frim, who's on our um, at, on our faculty as a as a part-time sessional adjunct faculty this fall, teaching a couple courses. Um, and we'll be, well, this year, we'll be in the spring semester as well. But um, tomorrow morning early, she and her little daughter are departing for places out east. Um, she will be going to Hamilton, where she will defend her doctoral dissertation. Um, that is a foreboding task, an intimidating process. Um, almost everyone who has a doctorate has horror stories. Nobody else wants to listen. Um, but um, Professor, you feel <laughs> Professor, we're we're tired of listening. We want you to be done. No, we no, I'm just kidding. We want you to be done though, and um, we want it to be a marvelous experience for you. But in our opening prayer this evening, um, I I'm going to pray for. Um, the ears that are open, minds, hearts to hear what we have to say and talk about with ministry. But I'm also going to include um, Professor Frim in her um, in her defense this week as she um, stands up, defense, defends, and, and um, stands up for what she's learned and everything that she has to profess. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day, for keeping us warm on a cold wintry day for reminding us of the warmth of your love and the Holy Spirit who continues to not only enliven your church, um, but also to lead and guide through your word and your sacraments of word. We ask that you would open our minds to learn, um, our hearts to appreciate and value the way that you provide for your church and the people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way that you have divided those gifts um, so that they may be useful in a broad range of ministry beyond just the pulpit. Continue to bless your church with the gospel of Jesus Christ, purely discussed, studied, taught, preached, proclaimed, and lived by your people. And this evening, Lord, um, we entrust to you our presenter, um, Professor Friend. 
We also ask that as she uh, presents, not only would she um, speak clearly, but also that her faith would radiate and that would have an impact on each of us as listeners. We pray as she leaves um, in the early in the morning for the defense of her dissertation, that you would take her safely there, she and Ingrid at both, that you would allow that experience to be a wonderful positive affirmation of all that she's learned. Help her recall and her defense to be spirited and to proclaim a witness and testimony to the Jesus Christ of St. Paul the Apostle as he proclaimed that truth of the justification that we have through Jesus Christ alone. Bless her, lead her, and guide her tonight and always in your care. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, Professor Friend, I turn it over to you for the rest of the evening. Yes, well, welcome back to those of you who were here with us last week, and welcome to the new people that we have here this week. I'm glad to see each of you here. So just as a quick recap, last week we talked about ministry, but we talked about a, the, the term ministry we defined in quite a, a wide sense of the term. So we noted that ministry is not just about uh, the pastoral ministry, but that there were many examples in the New Testament, and that's what we focused on, the little Old Testament, mostly New Testament, uh, many examples of ministry happening beyond what we might see as the equivalence of the pastoral office in the New Testament. So we focused mostly on the biblical text last week, and this week we are going to move beyond that. So ministry still, we can think about this wide definition of all Christians being involved in ministry in various different ways. But today I want to narrow our focus from that very wide definition just a little bit um, and look at some of the particulars of what we call the auxiliary or helping offices. And that's not a term we find in the biblical text, but I'll explain to you where that comes from and why we use that particular term. So when we were looking at the New Testament last week, we noted the emergence within the text of a couple of different kinds of leadership roles within the early Christian church. And we narrowed it down to a group we called overseers that had lots of titles that seemed to be referring to the same office. The elder, the pastor, the preacher, apostles, the overseers all seemed to be under the same kind of category. But then there was this other thing called deacons that we noted as being something different. And so today we're going to focus more on what those deacons might have been, and we'll talk about them in contrast to the overseers. That's the term I'm going to use um, when it comes to the office that is of oversight, what we would equivalent to call the pastoral office t uh, today. Um, and so we can see that this pattern between an overseeing office and a helping office is established early on in, in the New Testament, but we also saw Moses needing helpers as well. That was something we looked at um, as an example. Moses and his father-in-law Jethro says, Moses, you can't do this. You're going to wear yourself out. Here is a, something you should do. Get some people to help you. So this pattern is established early and carries on throughout history. So Moses and the Apostles. Um, and so New Testament, the New Testament tells us that ministry goes beyond the pastor, and that's what we're going to focus in on today. So this week, like I already said, I want to narrow our focus uh, from that very, very broad definition to something slightly narrow, narrower, um, and we'll look at the deacons in particular. So one thing we're going to do is we'll look at some more biblical texts. Um, some of them we've already looked at, but I want to revisit them briefly tonight just to pull out a different aspect of things. And we'll look at a biblical definition of deacon, or a description as best as we can find, and the very little evidence we have, what exactly were these deacons and what, what did they do in the New Testament. And then we'll look at some history um, beyond the New Testament period, and we'll jump ahead in history quite a lot. Uh, we're going to skip all the way up to Walther, which is the 1850s is, is where we're going to go. So we'll skip the, the earlier history. There's lots of very interesting things in that period also about deacons and, and overseers and bishops, but for our needs, we're going to skip that. Um, and we'll just talk about Walther and some of his concepts of this auxiliary office or helping offices. Um, this is where we get the term auxiliary office or helping office comes from Walther. And his 
uh, description also includes references to the Lutheran Confession and to other theologians, uh, Lutheran theologians and other theologians in history. So we'll also look at them. Can you see the screen through my head? <laughs> some of you I see are going <laughs> back and forth. Not some of you can't. I'm going to, hmm, I don't know. What do you think is the best if I should move this Probably way? Sorry if I'm just blocking somebody else with you. Is this better for everyone in the room? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay, That's good. great. <laughs> so we're going to look at uh, Walter and his perspective. We'll note uh, in, in um, our discussion of Walter, we'll note some of the other theologians that also have these same ideas. And then we'll skip to the modern concept of deacon within Lutheran Church Canada. Where did that come from? Uh, we'll no learn that the term deacon is not a fixed Term. It can mean many different things. So if you go and talk to your Anglican friends or your Catholic friends and you talk about deacons with them, they understand that word completely differently. Um, it's still the idea of helping is behind it, but what exactly that term means within their church body is different from what it means within our church body. So we need to just be careful when you're talking about deacons with others. Uh, make sure you know what kind of deacons you're talking about and, and what you're referring to. And then we'll take a little bit of time to talk about the Office of Deacon today within Lutheran Church Canada. Now that it's been instituted, uh, it's been around uh, officially for a couple of decades. Um, where where are the deacons today? What do they do, and where can you find them? So we'll start off then with a biblical definition of deacon. Uh, if you were here last week, the slide is familiar to you. We went through each of these passages. We marked off what terms were used for leaders in the New Testament, and then we noted that the apostle, the preacher, the teacher, and especially the elder, the overseer, and the pastor all seemed to refer to the same person, or at least the same people perform those same tasks. Uh, but then we noted that the deacons seemed to be separate, and the evangelists and the prophets were kind of in the middle, and they didn't really, we didn't really find out much about them from these particular texts. Um, so this is one thing we need to recall from our minds from last week, just to keep that um, keep that in mind. So this deacons being a separate group is important. We're going to dig a little bit deeper tonight into some different texts as well. Um, last week we looked at 1 Timothy 3, and we just touched on a couple of passages in, in that chunk, but I'm going to go back and we're going to look at the section from verse 8 to verse 13 in more detail. We read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and we talked about it. I want to revisit it briefly to pick up on one more point out of that. And then we'll add Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, which we also looked at, but a little bit differently tonight, and Romans 16. So the first thing we'll do is have a quick look at Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. If you have a Bible and you want to pull it out, um, you can do that. Some of the translations that you're going to see on the screen are my own translations, so they're not maybe going to match anything that you've got, that the spirit should be there, but the words might be slightly different. Um, but all of the text is on the screen, so you don't necessarily need to have your own version unless you'd like to. So the first thing I want to do is to point out to you where uh, Philippi is. Oh, good, this has a little dot on it. So Philippi is right up here, Italy over here. Um, Jerusalem down here somewhere, Ephesus, Corinth, that helps you anchor where we're at, and Philippi right in the middle. So Philippians 1.1 1, 1 is the opening of a letter from Paul to the Christians in the city of Philippi. And it reads, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the overseers and deacons. And this is one of the texts that we looked at last week just to help us to establish this differentiation between overseers and deacons. Uh, but what I want to point out tonight in connection to this text is that here we have an example of overseers and deacons being connected very specifically to a particular location. We can see from the opening of this letter that there were overseers and deacons in the city of Philippi when Paul wrote this letter. And I think it's important to just consider the fact that the deacons seem to be, at least from this text, anchored to a particular place. It doesn't seem at this point that these deacons that Paul is writing to travel around like Paul does, uh, having starting missions in different places. They seem to be connected to this particular city, these particular ones anyway. 
Um, and then we also noted last time that the term overseer and deacon themselves, the Greek words, imply this idea of oversight and assistance, that, that these two terms are not the same. They don't refer to the same office. And so here we have an example of two uh, offices existing in the city of Philippi, and Paul is greeting them. Um, doesn't tell us much else about them. Clearly the Christians in Philippi know what they're all about, and so Paul doesn't feel the need to explain it. Uh, that is one of the frustrating things about studying the biblical texts is the writers didn't write them for us 2,000 years later. They wrote them for the people in their own time period and did not need to explain what an overseer or a deacon was or what they did because that was just assumed knowledge. So it, it presents a challenge for us. So keep those two things in mind. It seems to be local leadership um, and then there's this differentiation between overseers and deacons. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 3 is a very interesting chapter overall. The chapter begins with the discussion of qualifications for overseers, and then the second half of that text looks at qualifications for deacons. And we're just going to look at the qualifications for deacons specifically, but I'm going to note for you places where their qualifications for these two offices are similar and places where they're different. So on the screen here, you'll see red text, and those red texts um, represent things where it's identical or very similar qualifications between the overseers and the deacons. Um, the underlined words that you see, uh, for example, right here, represents the, the Greek word that's connected to deacon. So there's a verb and there's a couple of nouns, and so this is a verb here, uh, let them serve, uh, but I wanted you to know that that's connected to the same, the same Greek root, so just keep those in mind as we go through this text. So 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 10 reads, Deacons likewise must be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not devoted to drinking a lot of wine, and not greedy for money. They must hold the mysteries of the faith with a pure conscience. Also these people must be tested first, then let them serve if they are found to be above reproach. So similar requirements of the overseer are the fact that uh, these, both of them have to be worthy of respect, not devoted to lots of wine, or some texts uh, translate it, not a drunkard. Also, not greedy for money. Money is not the object of, of this profession. And that they must be above reproach. The text goes on to say, the women, likewise, must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, temperate, and faithful in all things. Now, if you're following along in another version, like I said, this is my translation, um, you might say, well, it says their wives. It says something about the deacon's wives in, in your translation. And if you look, there's probably a tiny little number or letter beside it that's uh, a text note that will give you at the bottom of the page an alternate translation, which will say that women is also possible. Um, so it's a very confusing conundrum here because it's the same Greek word that refers to both women or wives and you have to look at the context to determine which is the appropriate English word here. It's a very contentious issue and the context is quite ambiguous. But the reason why I think that it's important to consider this translation of women is because that leaves the possibilities a little farther open. It doesn't restrict this particular set of qualifications to the wives of the deacons, but it also allows for that possibility that maybe here Paul is talking about female deacons, women deacons, um, as a possibility. Now it says nothing when you go up for it further, uh, back, sorry, into the first part of the text regarding the overseers. It never gives qualifications for their wives, um, so why should the wives of the deacons be signaled out? And there's really no possessive word there, the idea of their wives, the wives that belong to the deacons, that's not explicit in the text. So that's one of the reasons that I think it's important to consider this more open translation here. Uh, and we'll see an example later on of a possible woman who was a deacon. She's called by the term deacon in the text. And so um, that's why I have it translated this particular way, but I know that not everybody agrees with that and just keep that in mind as we're, uh, as we're studying. But the women, whoever they are, wives or just women, or both, um, they also have to be worthy of respect. They have to be not slanderous, uh, temperate, and also faithful in all things. Very similar requirements of the deacons and the overseers also suggest to me maybe that this is a separate 
category where Paul is repeating himself to indicate that this, sec this other category also needs to have those high standards. Verses 12 and 13 then go on to talk about deacons, and here it's explicit back to that term deacon. So we have deacons before, deacons after, maybe these women, whoever they are, can also be understood as deacons. Uh, deacons must be the husband of one wife, and they must manage their children and own households well. Those who serve well will acquire a good rank for themselves and great confidence in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So first of all, it talks about the husband of one wife. I'm not sure we should look at that as an explicit prohibition against polygamy. Um, it wasn't really a big issue for Romans or Jews at the time. I mean, it, it happened, but it wasn't like, this is the rampant problem that Paul is uh, really speaking against. It says, one woman man is a very literal wooden translation there. Um, possibly just simply referring to having, yes, a, a monogamous marriage, but being faithful in your marriage, um, not just you know, only having one wife but not having a mistress, uh, that was a problem in uh, the Roman society, right? So make sure that you're sticking to your own wife and only your own wife and not letting your eyes wander. So this is speaking to a faithful um, and upright marriage here. Managing their own children and their households well, the idea being that if you can't handle your own house, then you have no business trying to manage the church of God. And then it talks about uh, also, the, the idea of having to have a, a household that was well managed means that those outside the faith would look upon these Christian leaders as um, people who have it together, people that are worthy of respect, and, and that also reflects on the Christian church itself. If the, if the Christian church is made up of leaders who can't even handle their own household, then it's not very attractive for those outside looking in. So that's one of the one of the reasons why that might have been something that was required of them. And then they gain a good reputation, um, great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Their faith is positively impacted by their participation. Now, oh, I didn't put it up on the screen for you. I'm sorry. Please wave if I don't do that. I'm used to looking directly at the screen so I can see what's there. So all of the things I just said, right there. <laughs> Moving on to the next slide then, which I will try to advance. There's several differences. We noted those similarities, that red text that you saw on the screen. Those are the similarities. But the differences, I think, are important to also make note of. Uh, the overseers, which we didn't read about, that's in verses 1 to 7 of this text. They have particular things they are supposed to be and do that the deacons do not have. So for example, the overseers are said to, or they must be prudent, they have to be hospitable, skillful in teaching, not bullies, they should be gracious and peaceful, and not newly converted. Um, the overseer, very interestingly, is never required to be tested. The deacons must be tested. But the overseer, if you want to look at the testing relating to the deacon's faith, the overseers are required not to be new converts, and so you could say that those things are perhaps similar. But my point in, uh, in this is that the positions are not interchangeable. Overseer does not equal deacon. That's my little math symbol over here. Oh, what did I just do? <laughs> my math symbol here for us to, uh, to look at. They have different requirements. We've already considered, and I messed up the screen over here too, and I can't see. Um, Michael, help. <laughs> I'm sorry, I pushed a button. I pushed this button. If I push it again, I think so. Come back. Let's not do that anymore. <laughs> I like to fool with my clicker a little too much. I'll just keep talking if he can fix it for us. What do you want me to do here? I really destroyed it. The positions are not interchangeable, that was my point. The, the titles themselves do imply uh, a different role. We've already talked about that, but I think the fact that they have different requirements is also something we have to keep in mind. Um, the things that they tell us about the requirements for overseers and deacons, I would hesitate to say those are job descriptions. They don't really tell us much about what these people did, so much as what these people ought to have been. Um, but the fact that they have different requirements maybe suggests different, different kinds of responsibility 
um, and perhaps more responsibility for the overseers, which makes sense given what we understand about these two, uh, these two words in general. Oh, you fixed it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try to behave myself. Different requirements, different responsibilities. So looking at these two texts, the reason I started with them, with uh, 1 Timothy and with Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, is because I think these are the two clearest references to deacons in the New Testament. Um, there we have people explicitly called deacons. Um, another very clear text, in my opinion, is Acts, which we'll look at in a second. But there they're never called deacons. They are said to do deacon stuff, I guess you could say, and that's a very, very loose liberal translation of the term, but they don't actually call them deacons, and so we'll look at that in just a second. But from these two texts that we've just looked at, I think we can establish a loose definition based on the New Testament, what we do know, uh, of what a deacon might be, or the spirit behind a deacon. So we see here that they're people of firm faith. That was a very clear requirement in 1 Timothy. People of good character. There were several different character requirements that uh, give us the idea that the, the deacons needed to be upstanding citizens. Uh, even if their faith was good, but they were a terrible citizen, that's not good enough. Um, they seem to be connected to a local congregation. I didn't note for you that the letter of 1 Timothy is written to Ephesus. And so Paul is writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus, and he is there trying to troubleshoot some problems that the congregation is having. And so the reference to deacons that Paul gives to Timothy is connected to the deacons in Ephesus. So that there, there should, we should understand that to mean that there were people in that community that had that title or that role. So they seem to be connected to a local place, not traveling missionaries like Paul or some of his associates. Um, we also see that it's a separate position from the overseer, not interchangeable. It has different set of requirements, um, and also by definition, just by the, the term deacon, that it's subordinate or under the auspices of a higher position, which in this case seems to be the overseer. And I think also we have reason to reason to expect that deacons could be either men or women. That that term within uh, 1 Timothy 3:11. I think gives us a, a reasonable, reasonable assurance that it was not necessarily exclusively men, and we have some other, other examples too that we'll look at. So I wanted to start with the texts that were reasonably clear, and then use that as an opportunity to examine some other things. So I also talked to you, uh, saying that Acts chapter six is a pretty clear definition or a pretty clear example of deacons, except that word is never used there. Um, we say it's a pretty good example because it talks about the apostles needing help and that this kind of a role is what we expect, it, we expect of the deacons once we've looked at them a little bit more. So what I want to do is look at Acts chapter 6 and then compare it with our definition and see, do we think that these people are actually deacons or uh, is there a reason to believe perhaps that they're not? And in the wider world of scholarship, there's a great debate between whether they're actually deacons or whether they're not. So. I'll just read the text for you again, and then I'll point out a couple of things. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So a couple of things just to, to notice. We see that the apostles needed help. They asked the, the congregation to appoint seven individuals for this task. They had some requirements of those people. And then it says they prayed and laid their hands on them. 
I'm not going to get into a discussion about ordination and where that comes from. My point here is that they specially set these people apart. However they did it, whatever they called it. Um, we look back on this text and we do see the, the concept of ordination that we use for our pastors. Not saying that deacons are ordained. That's a completely different presentation. But um, what I want to us to notice is that they, they said these are the seven we're going to choose and then let's do something that sets them apart for this task. And what they did was lay their hands on them and pray. So just a, a summary then of what we've got in Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. I guess chapter, verse 7 doesn't really talk about uh, the deacons too much. But it's a secondary leadership position. It's created to meet the needs of the Jerusalem church. Uh, the people who fill that role have to meet requirements of character and faith. Um, the leaders were set apart for service in a public way and care and concern went into the process of selecting these leaders. They were highly valued um, and they were put, put aside and, and chosen very carefully. So when we look at our definition, loose definition that I pulled together of deacons, how do these seven men compare? Well, we said that deacons ought to be people of firm faith and we see here that they were supposed to be full of the spirit. Um, people of good character, that these men were to have good reputations. We talked about them being local servants in Philippi and in Ephesus, and we see that this is particularly in Jerusalem where this is taking place. Now we could argue that at this point, most of the entirety of Christianity is in Jerusalem, <laughs> um, so it's maybe not the best comparison, but still they were appointed to serve a particular need in that particular place, and I think that that's important to just keep in mind. Um, we said that deacons were subordinate to a higher position of overseer, and here we see the deacons under the auspices of the apostles. Uh, the, the twelve are the ones who said, we need help, find us some people, and that the twelve still are the ones in charge of the congregation. Um, we said that deacons potentially could be men or women. In Acts chapter 6, we only see men, uh, but there is still, like we'll see, different, uh, different places where women do serve in the New Testament. It's not excluding women in Acts chapter 6 necessarily, but the apostles did say to choose men for this particular task. So we can see that they're, they're reasonably close. So I'm, I'm convinced that Acts chapter 6 tells us of the first deacons that we have. Now what about others? Are there other people in the New Testament that are called by this term? Uh, the, the Greek term is diakonos for those who are interested. There are a handful of other people that this term is attached to. Uh, Paul, Apollos, Timothy, someone named Tychicus, which may not be a familiar name to all of you, and Erastus. Now, I want us to remember that the term has a wide range of meaning because we're going to, I'm not going to look up the passages that deal with each of these men, but I'll describe to you how the term deacon is used in connection with them. And we'll see that it's not really, it doesn't really seem to be in the same kind of spirit as we see with the examples we've already looked at. So if you want to go and look up the texts yourself, it's here um, on the slide, and if anyone um, in the room or, or online wants the slides, I can, uh, I can make those available. But two of the things that I want us to consider when we look at these other uh, four or five men here is we can assume that they were of good faith and of good character. They're Christian leaders. Um, we'll just give them that. We'll assume that that is, is true about them. So what are the things that set deacons apart then that we can maybe evaluate for these individuals? And the two things that are from our definition that are we're able to look at are, are the secondary leaders or are they the main leader? And where do they serve? Do they serve in a particular location or do they serve in many locations? So if we look at Paul, he's a familiar character to most of us, I'm sure. He's not a secondary leader. Paul is, Paul is right up there. He's in charge. He calls himself an apostle. And he directs a great number of other individuals. And he's certainly not a local leader either. Paul is very itinerant. And he moves around and visits many different places. Now, Apollos is the same in the same sort of position. We don't hear as much about Apollos in the New Testament, but he shows up in a couple of places. He's also a traveling missionary. Um, he doesn't really seem to be under anybody else's guidance or, or control. So I would say Apollos and Paul, they don't really qualify as deacons under our definition. The term that's being used, uh, or the, the, the sense in which that term is being used to attach to them, that does not have to do with the same kind of thing that we're talking about. 
uh, when it comes to it, this supporting role. Now what about Timothy? Timothy is a sort of, I guess you could say, a secondary leader. He works with Paul. Paul is the one who says, Timothy, go to Ephesus. Timothy, go to Corinth. Timothy, go wherever you're going to go. I, he, he directs, uh, Paul directs him. But when, it, when we look at the term deacon connected with Timothy, um, the term is not about him being a servant of Paul or a servant of a particular local congregation. It talks about him being a servant or a diakonos of Christ. And so there again, we see a different use of that term. The same is true for Tychicus. He works with Paul as well, but when the term is used in connection with his name, it's talking about him being a servant uh, of Christ. And so this is, I think, a different situation than what we've got in 1 Timothy 3 and in um, Philippians 1.1 1, 1, and in Acts chapter 6. Now, Epaphras is a different sort of situation. He's not a secondary leader, though. Uh, we don't hear much about him, but he seems to be the founder or uh, the main leader in the Christian community, community uh, in Colossae and Laodicea. So he's not a secondary leader. He doesn't seem to be under the auspices of anyone else, though he might be a local leader. So I think it's important to remember that this term for deacon is flexible and can refer to some different things. Now the last person I want us to look at um, is Phoebe. Now Phoebe shows up in one tiny verse in the book of Romans, and this is Paul at the very end of the letter. Uh, Phoebe might have been the person bringing the letter to Rome, and so he says, I introduce to you Phoebe, our sister, who is also a deacon in the church, or of the church in Centuria. Centria is near Corinth, and so Paul is commending her to the Roman Christians, and he uses the term deacon, diakonos, to, to describe her. And I think that that's significant um, here if we look at our definition that we've been uh, talking about. No, okay. Um, here we see uh, deacon in connection with the church, uh, the, the church at Centria. She is said to be a deacon or servant of that particular location. Um, and also, so that idea of she's not a servant of Christ, but she's a servant of the church, and a servant in a particular location. Um, this text also uh, may imply, because it calls her a deacon, that she's subordinate to another leader in that location, although we really don't have any other information. Phoebe is perhaps um, one of the best examples of deacon that we have in terms of uh, a name associated with the term, and Phoebe is a woman. Um, so another reason why I think it's possible that even in the New Testament, we had women serving in this particular role. Not, it's not working. I'll just use the arrow. Sorry. When, uh, I'm taking to the next slide. Okay. So, we've talked about biblical deacons. Now let's, uh, let's look at some... How does this translate then into, into modern deacons? What I hope you have seen from the, uh, the discussion that I've talked about so far is that this idea of helping office or deacons, we can talk about them as being helpers, is something that we clearly see in the New Testament. Um, moving from the New Testament to the modern Lutheran Church Canada diaconate is a huge leap. There's 2,000 years of <laughs> stuff going on in between there. And unfortunately, we, we won't be able to talk about all of that. But through the centuries, this term deacon is used to describe different roles, and deacons did different things and were subordinate or su supervised by different people and had different tasks associated with them. Um, but for our purposes, the most pertinent discussion for Lutheran Church Canada is going to take us to CFW Walther. Um, he is an important, significant theologian within uh, Lutheran Church Canada, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod circles. And it's from Walther that we get this term of auxiliary or helping offices. And it's miraculously working again, it just needed a break. So CFW Walther, uh, Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther, was the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. He wrote many, many influential works, but the one that's most significant for us tonight is something called Kirche und Amt, which is the German written in 1852. Uh, it's got two editions in English. One is from 1987, Church and Ministry. It's a blue book. I'll show you the cover in a little bit. 
But there's also a more recent um, edition of that. It's not a full new translation, but it is uh, it's a little bit updated, and it was in 2012. It's called The Church and the Office of the Ministry, uh, bringing out the, the term, what is meant by ministry, just a little bit more clearly, ministry in that particular context. So here we have uh, the two covers of the two different books, if they're familiar to you. Church and Office, or Church and the Office of the Ministry, that particular book, has nine theses or nine statements concerning the church, and then it has ten theses concerning the office of the ministry. And we're going to just look at one, the, the entire thing. I'm sure it's very interesting, but not, not directly pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. Uh, Walter writes this in response to some conflict that the what would eventually become the LCMS, um, as it was being formulated, some conflict that they were experiencing concerning what exactly the pastoral office was um, and the relationship between pastors and bishops and pastors and other pastors. So the LCMS asked him to write a document concerning this and they uh, accepted it in their convention in 1852 and so it became their statement about these particular issues. And when Lutheran Church Canada became independent of the LCMS, we also brought these works with us uh, into Canada. And so this is also a really important statement for us to look at. So what we are interested in is thesis eight on the ministry. Um, and the thesis number eight on the office of ministry reads, the preaching office is the highest office in the church from which flow all other offices in the church. And this is the, the updated version or updated translation of, of the text, the Harrison text. And so here we have a lovely group of pastors. I think this is Dr. Helwig's installation. I shamelessly stole the picture off of uh, the seminary's website. So the preaching office is the highest office, according to Walther. And from, all, from that office, all other offices flow. And so the, that's what we're going to look at. That's where this concept of deacon um, finds its niche within Lutheran Church Canada. Walther supports his position by scripture, by the Lutheran confessions, and also by references to theologians throughout history. Some of them are reformers, that Luther and Chemnitz, we're going to see some things from them, and others are much more ancient than them. Uh, Jerome is a fourth century theologian that Luther also, or sorry, Walther also quotes uh, and refers to based on this issue. So some of the scriptural support that Walther gives us is some of the stuff we've already looked at, so I'm not going to rehash it again. But I do want to pull out just a couple of other things that are related to this concept of the preaching office being the highest office and then everything flowing out of that. So Walter makes these two points. The, the highest office, he's got arguments about why he thinks the, the preaching office is the highest office. And then he's got arguments about why he thinks the other offices flow out of that. So you'll see some of the, some of the support that he gives is related to one or the other. So first he talks about the office of the keys, and he states that the office of the keys is entrusted to congregations and administered by their pastors. And the office of the keys is this task or this privilege that Jesus gives to forgive and retain sins. And so the support that Walther uses for that from scripture is from Matthew. It says almost the exact same thing in Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18. Um, Jesus is speaking and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And the same, very similar uh, text in Matthew 18, 18. Now, he also points to John, John chapter 20, same sentiment, but Jesus is, says it in a slightly different way. He says, again, uh, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. And he's speaking to the apostles here. So this is where we get a very clear connection of this command or this gift being given to the apostles to administer on behalf of the church. Uh, and with that, he breathed on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And so from these texts, Walther says that the, the preaching office, which he says flows from the office of apostle and is connected to that, is the highest office. And then everything else has to fall underneath that. He also goes on to say in scripture, those who fill the role of the pastoral office have various different titles. He gives examples of elder, bishop, ruler, stewards, and the like. We've already looked at the texts um, last week and earlier this week that pertain to that. 
Um, he says those uh, filling subordinate offices are called servants or deacons. We've already looked at those texts. Um, they serve the congregation and the pastor, and he points specifically to Acts chapter 6. So we've already looked at that, so I don't need to, to review those for you, but I just wanted you to, to be aware that that's where Walther also picks up his idea. Uh, one other thing that he brings out is that the pastors are responsible to, to watch over their congregation, and they have to be prepared to give account for the souls of the people in that congregation. Uh, and he cites Hebrews chapter 13. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. And here, the idea that all other offices flow out of the pastor, uh, pastoral, pastoral office, um, very importantly, if the pastor is given charge of that congregation, then he also needs to be needs to be able to know that those who he's delegated his tasks to are doing a good job of it because he is ultimately responsible also for the work that they are doing. Uh, and so this points to the great responsibility that our pastors have. So just in summary then of, of Walther's scriptural points here, that God instituted one office, the apostles, and from that he would say the pastoral office. The apostles entrusted a portion of their tasks to the deacons in Acts chapter 6. Um, pastors are responsible for all the things in their congregation and may therefore delegate, um, by example from Acts chapter 6, some portion of their responsibility to others. Walther sums it all up in this great statement, and I put it here uh, because he, he makes one more point here that I think is important for us to look at. He says, hence, the highest office is that of the preaching office, with which all other offices are also conferred at the same time. Every other public office in the church is part of the same, or a helping office, that stands at the side of the preaching office. Therefore, the offices of Christian day school teachers, who have to teach the word of God in their schools, distributors of alms, sextons, presenters at public worship, and all others, uh, are all to be regarded as churchly, holy offices, which bear a part of the one church office. They stand at the side, for they take over a part of the one church office and stand beside the preaching office. What I want to point out here is that, yes, Walther says that all these other things flow out of the pastoral office, but he says precisely because of that, they are uh, very important churchly holy offices. They bear a part of the pastoral office. So we can't say, well, deacons are subordinates. They're not important. Uh, they're just kind of this extra thing. That's not what Walther is saying when he talks about the, uh, the office of deacon or the, the helping offices, that they also have a, a very important role to play. Now, I don't want, to, I don't have too much more here before the break, but a couple things I want us to see is also where does Walther uh, bring in the confessions? And I have a couple examples from the confessions and a couple of examples from theologians that I think will also um, help to, to show the, the support for this office of deacon within our own church body. Now, uh, the apology of the Augsburg Confessions states that the preaching office is the highest office in the church. Um, we found this afternoon, I was looking, I wanted to go and read the rest. What, what is around this text? What else is it talking about? If you're also very curious like me and you go and you follow your English, English translation, you will say, but it's not there. It is not there. It is not in the English translation. It's part of the German text of uh, the Apology of the Augsburg Confessions. I don't think that makes it bad, but for whatever reason, it's not in the English. The, the Latin is original, and that's the basis of most of our English translations. So Dr. Helwig very helpfully helped me sort that out. Um, but still, a very concise statement here that uh, Walther's pulling out. The preaching office is the highest office in the church. Um, and then he goes on, um, looks at the document, The Power and Primacy of the Pope, where here the, the author is saying that Jerome, this is a theologian, um, fourth century theologian, Jerome, way back in the 4th century, teaches that the distinction between bishop and pastor stems merely from a human arrangement. Um, so the controversy that he's referring to here is the concept that bishops were more important than the regular average pastor. And that has sort of become commonplace in, in theology over the centuries. But here, the power and primacy of the Pope, that particular document in the Confessions, is saying, no, that's not the case, that all, all pastors are 
equal uh, to each other, and that the bishops are not more important, um, and that it's merely a human distinction that's being made between them. And that's one of the things that Walther is, is arguing when he says that the pastoral office is the highest office. So those are the two, uh, two bits of the confessions I wanted to share with you. Because it references Jerome, oh, I totally destroyed it. Oh, it's back. It's back. Because it references Jerome, I wanted you to see what Jerome was talking about. Um, Jerome here has a couple of quotations when you get into the theologian section, and this is what um, the power and primacy of the Pope is referring to. Let the bishops then know that they have preeminence over the elders rather by custom than by the truth of a divine institution. And then also, the apostle teaches most clearly that elders are the same as bishops, but that afterward one was elected and placed at the head of the other, uh, and this was done to secure a remedy against faction. So it was there to help the problem, it's not there because God put it there. And there's the second quotation. Um, and one, I have uh, one quotation from Luther that also su supports this that uh, Walter brings out here. And this, this particular one of Luther talks about that idea that the office of deacon or that other offices flow from the office of pastor. A lot of this other stuff that Walter's been talking about focuses on the first part of that thesis. So here Luther states, um, therefore the one to whom the ministry is entrusted is entrusted with the highest office in Christendom. After that, he may also baptize, administer the sacrament, and minister to souls. Or, if he does not desire these duties, he may adhere merely to preaching, letting others baptize and administer the minor offices, as did Christ and all the apostles. So here it, it almost says, if you're, you're a pastor, you have to do all these things, but if you'd rather not, that's okay. As long as you preach, you can get somebody else to do the rest. I don't know if that's really what he was saying, but, but the, uh, the idea is that others can assist uh, as the pastor deems uh, appropriate, so long as he also preaches himself. And then the last theologian uh, is Martin Chemnitz. He is a very important writer uh, and theologian in the Reformation era as well, and he is one of the authors of the Formula of Concord, which is part of our confessions. This statement is not in the Formula of Concord, but it's, it's written by Chemnitz. And he says, because many offices pertain to the ministry in the church, that in a large assembly of believers cannot well be attended to in whole, and in part, by one person or a few, the church, as it began to increase, began to distribute these ministerial offices among certain grades of servants in order that all things might be done orderly, decently, and in an edifying way. So those are the theologians I wanted to, to point out to you. And here Chemnitz, um, the thing I want to notice about him is he says this is done so that things are done in an orderly, decent way, an edifying way, not a, a haphazard kind of, um, kind of way. There's an order to this. It's not just at random, whoever decides it should be a certain way. So bringing all of this together, a summary of the ideas we see in, in this thesis number eight of Walther's. Um, the idea of the helping offices or auxiliary offices are not invented by Walther. We've already seen the evidence for them in scripture and the confessions. We see them echoed by theologians throughout history. Um, they're created in the spirit of keeping good order and in serving God's people faithfully. Um, and they are there to support that office of pastor uh, and help that office to, to do the best it can to be able to, the, the office of pastor or the pastors themselves to be able to do their job um, in a, an effective and efficient way. So after the break, we're going to take a break now, but we'll look at where, where we went from Walther. After we have the, these ideas that developed from Walther, Lutheran Church Canada then uh, 150 years later, created something official, um, the Office of Deacon, and so that's where we'll go after that. We'll take a, take a break. Ten, is it 10 minutes? 15 minutes? Somewhere, there. Somewhere, Somewhere in there. there. <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes, come on back, and we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Thanks so much for your, your attention the first half. I'm sorry, it's because I'm in the room. Is that you? Okay. I'm happy to let you take the blame. I was happy to take the blame. I'm not happy to take the blame, but it is. It's okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, anti machinery.
No, it's, 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 it's true. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't argue with that. No, it's true. <laughs> of everything surrounding it and touching on it, you're the expert in that. That's the whole point of the yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. I I need to be reminded of things like this. It's been such a yeah. such a ridiculous process. <laughs> it always is like, you've had a quite like Jim variety. was saying, everybody has horror stories. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else that my advisor told me and it, it's been true in my experience. Uh, if the questioners start turning on each other, <laughs> you, know, <coughs> you know, when 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 it starts getting into these internecine battles, <laughs> you go right ahead. You go right ahead. Sit here, please. Well, I've got time. I've got popcorn. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm trying to just. Some days I'm really calm about it, and other days I just. Yep. Really anxious, but I can't. I can't do anything more. I mean, mm -hmm. there's more that that could have been done, but I could not do more in the writing and the preparation. Other than not sleeping, you know, right. there's no. I have no more time to do, yeah. and so. I'm glad you're taking a lot extra time to rest before. You. <laughs> yeah, I like. I wanted to take Ingrid because I wanted John and Monica to have a little mm -hmm. extra time with her, but I didn't want to fly in. The crack of dawn on Thursday morning, and leave her with strangers, basically, and then you know go off the next day and be exhausted. So that extra day is yeah. turning out to be a really good, good, good move on multiple fronts. And then yep. we'll have Saturday. Oh, really? I've done the defense, and we can just kind of relax and come back. Thank you. Yeah, I will. I'll. Uh, we'll, see. we'll find out next week. Yeah. No, no I'll pass on the message. It should be over around noonish, yeah, between 12 and 1 Eastern time, and then apparently there's lunch. I'm not sure if that includes me or they're going to banish me for lunch or I don't know what. But then I have to meet with my my advisor in the afternoon to go over revisions. Right. So it'll yeah. be an entire day process. Yeah, the, the most nerve-wracking part is actually when I take you out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm you're already like, done, right? Right, you're done, and that's okay. Whatever it is, it is. They just yeah, it's done. Yeah. I, I don't know if you did. Did you do oral? Um, oral counseling. Yeah, so it's the same, same thing. You know. Yeah. Did they call me back in the room? Did you get out of the room? Dad is <laughs> sitting there with this firm look on his face. He's my primary, and he's like, no. And he has a sentence that could go either way. Yes, you passed. Like, well, thank you. Is that you had to like draw it out before you could leave that statement Yeah. 
broke it into pieces. <laughs> Let the record and show. And I when walked in I the dropped room. it, it didn't break. <laughs> I did it once. As I How walked in the room. room. I only <laughs> dropped it once. <laughs> I pushed the wrong button a few times. Uh, St. Matthew is playing now. Oh, he's not playing now. I wonder if the batteries are down. Because there was a question question that wouldn't work, and then I questioned a little bit, and it's so. You know what? Master Bob, Master Key. I'm there in the school. Ah, okay. Oh, you're the Yeah, so the other two are the parish pastors. Okay, okay. That, that was the connection I was missing because we asked God to do the worship. I'm trying to remember the last time we were out at St. Paul's. I didn't remember you being up at the front there. I know it was two. I I know Pastor Buck, and I couldn't remember. So you're flying to Hamilton? We're flying to Toronto. My in-laws live in Brampton, and so they are enjoying some grandparents' time, I think, around the whole I study and then spend a month on things. You can't go that far and not bring the grass back. So, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a little high quite a bit. I was on the house for a number of years. Yeah, but it's an hour and a half. Yeah, but Yeah, I hope so. Two hundred and eleven. Okay, shall we start? Okay, we're going to begin. Oh, sorry. Let's begin. All right, so the first half of the evening, we looked at uh, some of the history and the theology and the scripture that goes behind this concept of the, the office of deacon. And I'm not sure if I've used the, the term diaconate or diaconal. Um, I maybe didn't define it, though. That's the, the term kind of related to the office of deacon that we used to help describe it. So if I'm talking about creating the diaconate, I'm talking about creating this office of deacon. Uh, within Lutheran Church Canada. So the second half of the evening, we'll look at the history that, that happened within Lutheran Church Canada when they decided we need to make something official um, related to this concept of the helping office and we'll create an, an official office of deacon or diaconate within our church structure. Um, we'll look at then some of the, the things that happened not just the process of that creation of the Office of Deacon, but then some of the history behind since it was created, what has happened with deacons in Lutheran Church Canada, and then some of the contributions that deacons have made and where you might find a deacon serving. So just a brief overview of some of the historical development. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod entered Canada in 1854, so this is just a couple of years after that document, Church and Ministry, or Church and the Office of Ministry, is written. And the first deacons arrived in Canada, um, if you want to use that term in retrospect, uh, in 1874 as Lutheran school teachers. Now prior to those teachers showing up in, in Canada, if there was a school associated with the church, it was often taught by the pastor, and sometimes a qualified local teacher would be drafted to assist, but not necessarily, uh, they did not necessarily have any training particularly related to teaching within a Lutheran school context. So the first officially trained Lutheran teachers came to Canada from, from the States in 1874. So after, uh, after that, 100 years go by, and we see post-1850, sorry, post um, we start to see a trend of teachers being called to serve, not in schools, but in congregations. So I, I use the term congregational worker to describe that, but it's a little bit of a shift. So rather than teachers just exclusively teaching in a, a Lutheran school, they are now asked to serve a congregation alongside a pastor doing various things related to education in the parish. And this is where we're going to get the beginning of um, youth leaders that have official training and, and directors of Christian education is what grows out of that concept. And so it was in, um, in the 1960s, late 1960s is when Lutheran Church Missouri Synod began to have official training programs for people to work as congregational workers. Uh, instead of training to be a teacher, uh, they would train specifically to serve in a congregational context. So it's a little bit of a difference uh, in the, the, the education behind these two uh, 
positions, but that's where we kind of see the beginning of our differentiation within Lutheran Church Canada today. We have deacons who are teachers and teach in Lutheran schools, and we're going to learn about that next week uh, with Pastor Dressler. But we also have deacons who serve in congregations as directors of parish services and directors of Christian education, directors of Christian outreach, and that's where I fall. I'm rostered as a director of parish services within Lutheran Church Canada. So this kind of differentiation goes back to beginning in the 1950s, really taking off in the 60s, and then uh, beyond that. The first official uh, director of Christian education came to Canada in the mid-70s. I can't remember the exact, uh, exact year, but it was in the mid-70s that we saw a, a rostered and trained DCE coming up from the United States from one of the uh, LCMS training programs. And at that point, we're still very closely associated with Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. It wasn't until the late 80s that we become separate. Do you need me to pause for a moment? Okay, I'm just going to pause. Mm -hmm. Michael is fixing something, but it wasn't me who broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Stop here. People are reporting no sound. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Well, I'll just, we want to make sure that they can track along with us, so we'll just take a moment here. Do you need to just talk to see if you can hear the sound? No sound. One here. Would you like me to leave? No, you can say <laughs> it. Okay. I have every confidence that Michael can fix it, yeah, even if you are here. Okay, we'll give him a chance. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll have to turn on the other microphone from this laptop. And okay, okay. You, I will continue, but let me know if you need me to stop or um, try something else. Okay, okay go ahead. Okay, so we, uh, we talked about the fact that it's uh, DCE ministry comes to Canada in the mid-70s, and this is still when we're part of Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and we haven't made, uh, we haven't become independent in Lutheran Church Canada yet. So our history is very much tied to their history at that point in, in time. And now it was in 1980 that Lutheran Church Canada, still, we're still not independent, but we did call ourselves Lutheran Church Canada, uh, sought to create church work training programs within the Canadian context. Um, I'm not sure when our seminaries began, but at this point in history, if you wanted to be a Lutheran teacher or if you wanted to be a uh, director of Christian education, you had to go to one of the U.S. Concordias in order to receive your certification. And as great as that was, you always lose a few people when you send them away <laughs> and they never come back. And so we wanted to have some training programs in Canada to prevent that loss um, <laughs> and other reasons. Uh, so Lutheran Church Canada begins to try to create training programs in the 1980s for teachers and also for what eventually becomes the directors of parish services, congregational workers. So it was in 1988 that Lutheran Church Canada becomes independent of Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And while all of that is happening, they're also um, thinking about training programs. And in 1989, Lutheran Church Canada approved a Lutheran teacher training program at Concordia University across the street. And it was also in 1989 that they hired their first director of church work programs at the university to oversee these two things. And it was approximately 1993 when the director of parish service program began. Um, that particular director of church work programs, Jeanette Leeds, I spent a great deal of time in the intervening years doing a lot of research and trying to develop a program for congregational workers that was going to meet the needs uh, in our Canadian context. And so at approximately the same time as that program is launched, we also see that the president of Lutheran Church Canada at that time, Edmund Lehman, he establishes a task force to study this concept of diaconal ministry with the hope of making it more official within our own church structure and polity. So he strikes this task force and it's made up of one of the district presidents, uh, one parish pastor, an other church worker, so not a pastor, but someone who's rostered, probably one of those teachers or directors of Christian education, um, someone who sits, sat on the Commission on Theology and Church Relations uh, and was a seminary professor, and two lay people. And these individuals were given 
several different mandates that they needed to fulfill, or one mandate with several different points to it. And I didn't put that up. There you go. The mandate that they were given first stated that they were to study the desirability of establishing a diaconate within Lutheran Church Canada in light of the Synod's present and future needs. They were then to determine the scriptural confessional implications of a diaconate with special attention to the relationship of the diaconate to both the ordained public ministry, so in relation to the pastors, and also to the laity of the church. And I emphasize here the scriptural confessional implications because we just looked at some of that when we looked at Walther. Um, and also then to define the office of diaconate in a manner that was consistent with scripture and the confessions as well as the historical and ecumenical understandings of the office. So right from the beginning, Lutheran Church Canada wanted to be sure that their office of deacon was in line with our history and our theology, uh, in line with scripture and in line with uh, our current practices. So it was very important that, it, that you, uh, it's important for me that you understand that it was done <laughs> in, uh, in a very orderly way orderly. and it wasn't yeah. just orderly. like, Whatever we feel like, this seems like it's a good idea, we'll just go with it. There was uh, very much a lot of thought put into the way the office of deacon was uh, put together. They also were tasked with determining the feasibility of establishing an office of deacon and to set forth steps that would need to be taken in order to do so. And then if they thought it was feasible, indeed, to create an office of deacon, they also were to uh, create criteria and qualifications for the diaconate. They were to look at the status of the diaconate within the structure of Lutheran Church Canada, um, if they should be rostered, if they should be ordered in some particular way, how that should work. And they should also draft some requirements and standards for admission to the diaconate. And so these are the six points of responsibility that that group of people was uh, were asked to undertake. So what actually, they did then was they looked at the things that they were supposed to do, the, the things they needed to accomplish, and they determined to write a couple of different documents in order to study the issues, and they were presented to convention and studied and, and sent back, and eventually we had a report from them. So they determined that a historical review of the diaconate and the scriptural confessional implications of the diaconate, looking at Lutheran teachings, with an emphasis on the role of the diaconate relative to both clergy and laity, and how that related to Lutheran Church Canada in terms of ecclesiastical administration. That was that they decided they were going to do this study. And that resulted in two documents. One was called the Scriptural, Dogmatic, and Historical Perspectives on the Re-establishment of the Diaconate in Lutheran Church Canada. And the second document was called A Proposal for the Ecclesiastical Administration of Diaconal Ministry in Lutheran Church Canada. If you're very interested and would like to read those documents, you can do that. Um, they are in the proceedings of the convention for, I can't remember the year, but it's going to be between 1993 and 1999. Um, it might even be the 96 convention. That you can go and read exactly what they proposed and what they wrote on these particular uh, topics. So individual members of the task force prepared the documents. The task force reviewed those and made edits as they saw necessary, and then they are presented to the church. And they also then um, had an overarching set of recommendations based on their study. The first thing that they recommended that yes, indeed, we should establish a rostered diaconate. The term rostered means that the, the people that are part of this office are on a particular list that says that they have qualifications um, for that particular position. They're also required to sign the Constitution of Synod and to adhere to the confessions and, and scriptural positions. Now, they also recommended that deacons, the, the voting rights of deacons at conventions be considered with the goal of granting those voting rights. And we'll see that that is still an issue that is, is still in process. That's something that has not occurred um, and is still under discussion. But it was one of the things that the task force originally said uh, ought to be considered carefully. They also said that those who are already serving in, uh, in the capacity of a deacon, according to the definition they set out, ought to be added to the roster based on their previous training and years of experience. So if someone had um, training, special training as a director of Christian education or, or whatever, that they should automatically be added to this roster. If you did not have any training, if you just 
uh, the congregation hired you because they thought you'd do a good job at it, but you had no credentials maybe behind that, uh, then you couldn't be added to the roster. You had to have uh, training in place before you could do that. Mm -hmm. They also suggested, we're not going to determine uh, the requirements for getting on. Uh, the appropriate synodical entities should do that. And I think it ended up being, uh, I, I don't know actually who it was, probably the, there was a board for higher education at the time, and they probably were, were highly involved in that. They also, uh, the, these things went to various different conventions, and each different convention at different stage of development occurred. So in 1996, this is where the reports were. Uh, reports, uh, those two reports that I mentioned were uh, given and recommended to, and they were, sorry, they were recommended and accepted by the convention for study and response. So between 1996 and the next convention in 1999, there was a great deal of circulation and discussion of those things uh, among the congregations and circuits. And then in 1999, the diaconate was officially established. So that convention is when they said, yes, we want to do this, and everything was set in place. But at this point, we established the diaconate, but they were not rostered at the time. Just we have this group of people, but there was no official uh, roster created. In 2002, at uh, that convention, that is where deacons became rostered and were able to become members of synod. Now remember that they initially said, this task force said that deacons ought to perhaps be given voting rights. Um, that's still something that is, is up for discussion. And at every convention since that first convention, it has come to the floor and has not been resolved. Um, every convention since 1999 has raised that issue. The most, uh, 2014 is the last time that it was raised I believe, I didn't attend the 2017 convention, but I don't think we had time to deal with diaconal voting rights. There was a lot going on there. Um, 2014, the resolution pertaining to diaconal voting rights that was, uh, that was passed asked the Commission on Constitutional Matters and Structure to study the issue and to bring an interim report to the Synodical Board of Directors with suggestions on how it might occur, um, and then with a final report to the 2017 convention the, this, the tricky part about this is that we want to uphold two important historical uh, precedents or positions within our church body. The one is that all parishes are equally represented regardless of size. So if you add a deacon in there, you might get a congregation that has more representation. And then we also have equal representation between clergy and laity. And if you add a deacon in there, we're not really sure if deacons are clergy or lay. Well, they're not clergy, but they're not really lay, and we're not really sure. And so it's hard to know where to put them in. And so the, the Commission on Constitutional Matters and Structure was supposed to make some decisions or make some recommendations based on this. But of course, um, you may know that in the 2017 convention, we were also, the, the CCMS was also asked to do a massive restructuring project. And so unfortunately, the, the study that they intended to do concerning diaconal voting had to be postponed. I'm on the CCMS, and so they won't forget about it. We will talk about it, and whatever the result is, the result will be. Um, but it is still something that I think um, will continue to come to conventions if the CCMS doesn't um, make, a, make some recommendations regarding it. So um, that was the 2014 had to be postponed. Um, and so one thing though I do want to point out is that the restructuring did not overlook deacons. One of the other things that the CCMS was asked to do was to make provision for deacons to be more involved in the decision-making processes of our church body. And so the restructuring that ultimately passed at the 2017 convention provides for one deacon to be on the board of directors of Synod, which previously there wasn't really a mechanism in place for that to happen. And there's also an opportunity for a deacon, if available, to be on every mission and ministry council and every commission, um, the Commission on Constitutional Matters and Structure, Commission on Theology, Church Relations, uh, the Commission on Nominations and Elections, and the Commission on Adjudication, I think, is the other one. So there's an opportunity uh, for deacons to serve now in ways that we didn't have prior to the, the restructuring. And like I said, the, the study that they had been asked to do concerning diaconal voting is still something that they will, will work on. So that's a little bit of the history of where deacons, how they came through and some of the challenges that the church has faced um, relating, de relating to deacons in the last uh, almost 20 years since they've been 
been, uh, been around officially, not quite, but almost. So when we look at deacons today, where have we come from? Where are we going? What, what is a deacon? You know, how do we, where does it all shake down here? We see, based on the, the study that we've done on scripture and confessions, that the LCC Office of Deacon is instituted based on a modern need within Lutheran Church Canada. We perceived a need for assistance in our teaching, um, in our Lutheran schools, and also within our congregations. And so we established this official uh, Office of Deacon. And we see that it is a dignified and respectable office. It's not haphazard. It was put together with great care. Uh, men or women can serve as deacons, and in fact, there's probably more women, um, especially among congregational deacons. Uh, school teachers may be more evenly split, but a lot of the directors of parish services are women, not exclusively, but a lot. And we also see that Lutheran Church Canada deacons primarily serve within a local congregation or school. There are some service organizations that have deacons that work with them, but mostly uh, they work directly with congregations and schools. We also see that deacons are under pastoral supervision. A deacon is never uh, out there on their own. You never have a congregation that has uh, only a deacon and has no pastor. You would not be able to have all the needs of the congregation met that way. And uh, schools are also all connected to congregations. And so in that way, there's always pastors associated with the deacons that serve in the schools. Now, deacons do not preach or administer the sacraments. Um, those things we say are special to the pastoral office, and in, so that's an important distinction between them. And we also see that deacons, which are rostered, they do have particular requirements that they have to meet in order to be on the roster. They need to have scholarly and practical training. They need to have a recommendation to the office, someone who, um, through their education process usually, they have to pass a requirement that their institution is comfortable recommending them to be uh, as a deacon. And they also have to receive and accept a call. So even if you finish all your education and are recommended to the office, if you never actually serve, then uh, you don't get added to the roster. You're only added after you serve in your first uh, school or congregation. Now just take a moment to compare these, um, these uh, descriptions I've given you of uh, Lutheran Church Canada deacons and then also the, the scriptural idea of behind deacons within the New Testament. Just uh, have a quick comparison of them and see how close can we say they actually are. Now why did the New Testament Christians institute this particular office of deacon? Well if you look at Acts chapter 6, there was a perceived need in that community where these helping uh, officials were needed. In Lutheran Church Canada, there's also a perceived need in the churches, um, an idea to formalize the this office of people that were already serving. And so that perceived need uh, is the same kind of idea in both situations. Now, we said that in the New Testament, deacons appear to mostly be serving in a particular geographic location. We have a similar type of thing, not exactly the same in Lutheran Church Canada. Usually they are connected with a church or a school. We don't have an overarching deacon, of, you know, the deacon, deacon of deacons or whatever, the head deacon of the cross <laughs> of Canada. We don't have that. But we do have, uh, sometimes um, service organizations do have them, so the geographical thing is a little bit eh, not quite exactly the same, but maybe that's not important. Um, the level of respect that deacons are given in the New Testament seems to be that they're dignified, respectable, and an important, uh, important position. The apostles grant or ask these assistants in Acts chapter 6 to do important tasks. And also the idea that deacons are an important and respectable position within Lutheran Church Canada. We saw that from some of the descriptions we read about in Welfare that, and uh, cabinets to that they are important, uh, dignified, should be regarded um, highly. In relationship to other leadership positions in the New Testament, we saw that the deacons were subordinate to a higher authority, the overseers or the, the pastors. But we also see the same thing within Lutheran Church Canada, that the pastors are ultimately responsible for the things that happen in their congregations or the schools under their care, and the deacons are there to assist them. Now, how do we look at the, the duties given to a New Testament deacon in relation to their uh, supervisor? 
Well, we don't really know what the duties of a New Testament deacon were. It's really difficult to determine that based on the text that we have. But what we can say is that they were distinct. It seems that they were doing something different um, and had a different level of responsibility. And in Lutheran Church Canada, we see a similar thing, that the duties of the deacon flow from the office of pastor, but not all the duties of the office of pastor are open for the deacon to, to participate in. Um, and qualifications, we saw a whole list of qualifications within the New Testament for people of good character, of sound faith, that their lifestyle was um, reputable, that they passed the test. Uh, those are the kinds of things in the New Testament that we see. And in Lutheran Church Canada, we also require people to have certain qualifications. They, they have to have proper education. They have to have a call to serve. They have to have a knowledge of theology. Uh, and the proper kinds of personal skills and Christian character in order to fulfill that office. And we also saw in the New Testament the potential for men and women to serve, and in Lutheran Church Canada we also have that. So we can see that it's not exactly the same. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you it's exactly the same. But I think that we can be comfortable in saying that the office of deacon in the New Testament and the office of deacon in Lutheran Church Canada share that same spirit of supporting the pastoral office and of furthering the gospel through that. So let's just quickly um, ask ourselves, what if all of this we've talked about, that's great. What exactly does a deacon do, right? Um, and that's a, a question that even congregations who have deacons, I remember <laughs> sometimes they, so tell me again, we're so glad you're here. We're so excited to have you. What exactly do you do here? Okay, what, what does the deacon do? Let's go back to uh, back to the task force, that task force we talked about. Um, they had a list of things they thought deacons could do. They suggested, um, again, all activities of the deacon flow from the office of pastor. Not all pastoral activities were open to deacons. They explicitly said preaching and administering the sacraments were not something that they thought deacons ought to do. But they said the deacons fulfill an office of love, uh, doing things like charity, social work, and health care. They may participate in pastoral care in, in such things like counseling, visiting, uh, spiritual encouragement, scholarly research. They might participate in catechesis uh, and particular classroom teaching, and this is where uh, school teachers specifically came in, but also teaching within a congregational setting. Uh, and then administration and music were other areas that the task force suggested that deacons could serve. Now, I'm going to go into some more specifics of, of so, but what does that actually mean? Um, but I think it's important to consider for a minute how many deacons we have within Lutheran Church Canada. So I sat down with the, my most recent copy of the annual today and I started counting. We have 76 rostered deacons within Lutheran Church Canada. Um, active, not all of them are active. Um, in the ABC district, we have 10 congregational deacons, so there are other uh, directors of parish services, Christian education, outreach, something like that, uh, and 12 teachers. In the Central District and in the East District, we each, they each have one congregational, uh, active congregational deacon. But there's teachers within each of those districts who are candidates or who are retired. Um, but just because you're not active, doesn't mean you're not actually active, thank you. <laughs> there's, there's your numbers for you. I want to stress that when I say active deacons, these are full time. Um, they have a call full time to a congregation or school. There are 39 candidate deacons within Lutheran Church Canada. I am one of them. So um, just because you're candidate doesn't mean you don't do anything. You're active, <laughs> active all of them, I'm sure, in serving and using the skills that they have. They just don't have a full-time call. So they may be serving part-time. Um, I've served a couple of congregations part-time as a deacon while I was a candidate. Um, also, they might be volunteering their skills. There's many reasons why deacons and pastors uh, may be on candidate status, but you can be assured that those 39 deacons are using their skills to serve uh, wherever they are at. We also have 13 emeritus or retired deacons. Most of them are teachers, um, but they also, you can, you talk to anybody who's retired, they're always more busy in retirement than they were when they were working full time, and I, uh, that's the same for pastors, it's the same for, for deacons. And, those teachers may be serving as substitute teachers uh, in Lutheran schools, or they may be serving in their congregations using those skills uh, to further the work of God in those places too. 
So then, how do deacons serve? Where do you find them? Um, they teach all ages. Mission trips, I'm at the wrong page here. There you go. Uh, mission trips, uh, both local, kind of short-term missions within your local city, um, national, from places in your country, or an international mission opportunities, you find deacons. Teaching at home and in the mission field, you find deacons leading youth and young adult events, both um, in the congregation, but also at the district or regional level and at the synodical level. Deacons participate in counseling, in visitation. They live their faith. They encourage parents uh, of children as they seek to teach their children the faith. They teach all ages. They run mission organizations. They teach in schools. They coach sports teams, lead after-school clubs, uh, they train up future church workers from preschool and younger. They encourage and support the pastors that they work with, they empower volunteers, they lead choirs, they play music for services, whether it be the organ, the piano, some other instrument, they may sing, they listen, and they pray. And they serve on boards and committees as delegates at the circuit, the regional, and the synodical level. These four pictures are the four diaconal delegates to the 2014 convention. They bring, they are, be, they are there to do the work that God has called them to do in whatever location he has placed them. So into the future then, where, where is the diaconate going? The unfortunate thing for the Diaconate of Lutheran Church Canada is that in 2015, the training programs that were in place at Concordia University were cancelled. And so, since 2015, we have not had a mechanism for training new deacons within our church body. Um, and so currently that is still, unfortunately, the case. Um, Concordia Lutheran Seminary here is working with the blessing of the Synod to develop a DPS training program, which is only a small portion of, or half of the diaconal um, field, because we also have Lutheran teachers, but this is a beginning. And so hopefully in the next short time, year or two, um, there will be an opportunity for some deacons, new deacons to be trained within Lutheran Church Canada. But as the world changes and as ministry changes, not just for deacons, but for pastors, um, our training and the way we serve is also likely to change. But for whatever congregations can afford to have deacons, it hopefully we will be able to provide them. And whatever schools um, can exist and have teachers, hopefully we can at some point provide them with deacons who have the, the training to be able to do their job, uh, to do those jobs to the best of their ability. So that is my presentation about deacons and where we came from and, and why things look the way they do in terms of pastors and deacons within Lutheran Church Canada. But this is my last presentation, but it's not the end of the quest. So next week, um, we have Pastor Dressler, who's, who's here with us tonight, if you want to talk to him, get the early details <laughs> next week. Uh, he is going to talk to us about Lutheran schools. He is the uh, principal at the St. Matthew Lutheran School in Stony Plain. And so he will talk to us about the very important ministry that happens in Lutheran schools with uh, teachers who are rostered Lutheran teachers or just teachers who are Lutherans who have a, a great heart for teaching the children there. And then uh, the final week of Quest, we will have another deacon here, Michael Gillingham, who is a deacon at um, Bethel Lutheran Church in Church Park. And he's very involved in mission trips uh, and mission opportunities. And he's going to talk to us about ministry beyond our front door, not just uh, here in, in your own neighborhood, but other places too, and we take the gospel out. So that is that's where I'm going to end tonight. Are there any questions? I never stopped for questions at all tonight. Uh, anybody have anything they want to ask? Anything from the online folks? Were they able to eventually hear us? Okay, good. Questions? This isn't a question, okay. just an okay. observation. Yeah. Um, the seven that were uh, chosen, selected in uh, Acts, that's very early on. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that they didn't have uh, or didn't think of a particular term like deacon. Oh, yeah. That would definitely become the 
greater need on the, in the congregational set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this would grow as time goes on. Yeah, I think you're right. Acts chapter 6 is really, really, really early in the development of Christianity. Absolutely. Well, if you think of other questions later on, feel free to, to chat with me. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And have a, have a great night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Fern. Hopefully soon to be Dr. Fern. <laughs> We're all excited for that and for you. Um, some of us are thankful to have that experience in a rearview mirror. Yeah. Um, but I uh, <laughs> can sympathize with you as well, though, the challenges. Um, again, we appreciate you doing this. And one of the things, I don't know if it's been clear, but it's kind of been around this, but uh, as Professor Fern was mentioning that um, here at Concordia Lutheran Seminary, we are working presently with the Blessing of the Synod to develop a, a diaconal program. That is one of the key roles that Professor Friend is actually filling, is helping to develop this, uh, this program. And so that's so one of the areas that uh, you know, the rest of the faculty, like such as myself, cannot speak as clearly to because I've never been a deacon, I've been a pastor. But, um, and that. So we, we appreciate your assistance with that. So, uh, let us uh, close then with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have formed your church and raised up servants within your church throughout history to serve. We thank you for the many men that you have raised up to serve as pastors and the many men and women you have raised up to serve along them in various diaconal roles throughout the history of the church. We ask your blessing upon all those who are serving your church now in whatever roles those might be. We ask your blessing especially upon Deacon Frem as she is preparing to travel and defend her dissertation. And we ask also for your blessing upon all who are gathered here Please grant safe travels back home again, and help us and lead us and guide us that all that we do and say, whether it be those of us who are serving full-time in your church, and, or those who are receiving and are members of the church, may all that we do and say be to your glory. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. <coughs> Have a good week. Yeah, thank you.